Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure, CES. Oh, first, let me apologize. We're 11 minutes behind our schedule. Thank you for uh, bearing with us. Uh, we'll still go maybe 11 minutes over so that we get the full 90 minutes in. Uh, but uh, happy to be with everybody again tonight. Uh, we are in Philippians uh, chapter 2. We'll begin with verse uh, four, right, Ben? Verse four? Yes, and I don't know if it's intentional or not, Luke, but uh, we don't see your video. What do you mean? I don't, we, don't, we just see, we don't see your uh, video. We just see your oh, icon. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I forgot to turn my, thank you. I forgot to turn my camera on. There okay. you are. Well, I'm sure many people prefer it the other way, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Okay. Uh, right. Um, Okay, so uh, uh, we'll try to get started as soon as we can now, since we started a little late, but uh, let, we still want to say hello to everybody. So, Sister Renee, why don't you greet the congregation? Hey there, beloved saints. Happy to hang out with you guys tonight on this Wednesday. I'm looking forward to the study. I really love Paul's epistles. So it's nice to see somebody in the chat already, and we just started. So looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. Uh, all right, Brother Ben, say hello to everybody, please. Hello, everyone. It's good to be here again tonight studying with you guys. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, okay. Thank you, everybody, for being uh, listening. And uh, for those in the chat room, uh, okay, it's like we're all under one roof, uh, except for the um, it's a chat room instead of uh, being in, in the same building. Uh, and the uh, moderators there with the wrenches, uh, they are the deacons of the church. So we appreciate the moderators, what, what you do for us. So thanks to all. Let's, let's begin. Uh, Brother Ben, why don't you read the first verse and then we'll let uh, Sister Renee uh, teach on it. Okay. Philippians chapter two, verse four. Look not every man on his own things. Do you just want me to read one verse, sir? Uh, I'll read. I'll, I'll read verse four. Okay. So yeah. look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Is it me? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. You, you go ahead and, and uh, okay. respond to verse, verse four. Okay. Doke. Well, let's go back one verse. Um, Paul says, we'll go back to fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Now at the verse at hand, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So don't concern yourself only with yourself but upon the needs of others. What are your brethren going through? How can you assist them? How can you edify them? And to consider their needs, their burdens, as if they were your own. I think. Wow, it just, uh, it just dawned on me that uh, that verse is uh, very uh, relevant uh, to the conversation we had before uh, we went live. We, we, we had a, a discussion before the live program, and uh, I'd like everybody who was participating uh, to think on that. That's really what this, uh, one of the things that we want to get across to everybody is that, uh, uh, you know, everything we do, we, it's, it should not be about us. Uh, remember the acronym uh, JOY, J-O-Y, Jesus first. He's, he, our thoughts on him first. And then yourself is last. And of course, after Jesus, was, we think of other people. So if, if we can train ourselves and develop that, uh, that's what the Lord wants. That will please the Lord. And I think that in that way, we will have joy. Um, I, know, I know I was going to go with you next, Ben, but I, I, when I noticed that it was <laughs> pertained to our earlier conversation, I got excited. Go ahead, Ben. Well, I think uh, Renee captured the idea well um again i think it's a major theme in this epistle is um serving others and being selfless uh you know and uh just as christ is our example 
And, you know, I know from experience even, <laughs> um, helping others, even though, uh, especially when it's not intentional this way, but just helping others relieve, eases my own burden, either eases my own, um, uh, it just makes me feel lighter and happier, more joyous when I can when I can help others. Um, and uh, again, when when you're self serving, you start to, you you're you're building up guilt on yourself. Um, you know, even even if it's not uh, it, you're not consciously and you're subconscious, you know you're serving yourself, and it just it just it's a burden I think to serve yourself. And uh, and I'm not saying give your burdens to other people. Don't serve your burdens to other people. I'm not saying that, but uh, just helping others out. When, especially in a way that uh, that is very personal, uh, it can be it's a, it's a it's a great way to um, show your love for other people, and that's what Christ came to show us, uh, you know, as in His example. Okay, thank you, brother. Uh, well, uh, brother Hendricks, as usual, uh, has a um, a question for us that uh, uh, is relevant to the verse four. And uh, he wrote, uh, he says, panel, how is it what is in verse four different from being a busybody? Uh, well, I would say, Brother Hendricks, that uh, verse four, uh, I mean, I could see how you could think of that, but really, uh, it's certainly not the intention of, of the, the author when it says that we are, let me read it in the Amplified, by the way. It says, do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. So it's not like we're trying to, uh, you know, um, put everybody in the microscope and, and try to find out all the, the secrets in their lives. And, and then we're going to turn around and gossip about them. Uh, I, I don't get that at all. It's To me, it's clearly saying, uh, have compassion, have empathy for others, and think of others before you think of yourself. Okay, uh, do you want to uh, respond to Hendrick's uh, question, Renee or Ben? Well, I would say, you know, I know the King James says uh, uh, his own things, but the new King James says, let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So it's not in the interest of others to be a busybody and talk about them and, and share their secrets and share things that, that you knew you know that they probably don't want others to know. Uh, it's it's again it's about interest that you know, uh, loving your neighbor as yourself. Renee, what do you think of of, of Hendrick's uh, question? Not so much, huh? Well, I'm looking through, and I think I looked at his wrong question. <laughs> he says, well, how is it first four different from being a busybody? A busybody. Yeah, that's what I was trying to figure out here. Well, a busybody would be, do you be involved when a person doesn't want you involved? The body of Christ works as one unit uh we share our brothers and sisters our needs our pains our joys that's what we do a busybody is something that you have private and i am all up in your business and not just that i'm talking to others about your business that's busybody getting involved you and your wife had an argument so i'm going back and forth between you and your wife all up in your business that's different mm -hmm. When we come together as the body of Christ and people are suffering or they have good news or they need prayer, whatever, we're there to share those burdens. We're supposed to do that. So uh, a busybody would be when someone is not wanted or gets involved in private affairs in an inappropriate way or discusses you with others. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Renee. Uh uh, Renee, uh, you can read verse 5, but I noticed that verse 5 uh, is connected to the earlier verses, but uh, it, uh, and not to verse 6 or 7 or 8. So, so 6 and, and onward, uh, even though the punctuation looks like they are all connected there, but I think that verse 5 is just more about verse 4. So let's talk about that just for a moment, and then we'll, we'll move on to 5, 6, 7. Renee? Okay. Hold on. I got, a, I got so many things open here. 
So just uh, read five, six, seven, and then Ben answer, right? No, just read verse four and connect it to, to verse, uh, I mean, verse five and connect to verse four. And then uh, then we'll go on and read five, six, and those are all uh, part of one thought. I'm sorry, connect. You want you to Talk read verse, read verse just five? Verse five. Just verse five. Don't, don't, don't just go through any further. Okay? okay. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. But there's a colon there. That's why I was trying to say that punctuation makes you think that we, the rest, the following thoughts are connected. But if I read ahead, and let's just stop there before and not, and not going further. Connect verse five to verse four and three. It should have. We should have read verse right, five to verse four. Three. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay. All right. So verse five is just finishing up the thought of verse four and saying that this is this is Jesus's uh, way and of course, uh, we should imitate Jesus. So now, Renee, uh, I think uh, uh, let's read uh, uh, let's read uh, six, seven, and eight, Renee, together, oh, and, and let, let Ben uh, respond. But read six, seven, and eight for Ben, okay? Okay. So I'm going to start with five, though. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Okay, we could probably spend all night on those that chunk of verses. Amen. Uh, lot to, lot to unpack there, but... Uh, I'll just kind of kick it off here. Um, and, uh, you know, again, he's, he's bringing this up in, in response or kind of transitioning into, you know, this is how Christ was. Um, and and, and he, he's making basically making the argument why, why we should be like-minded and not be self-serving, but selfless, because that's what Christ was. And and I think he's kind of contrasting um, how they should be with, with these false teachers that have been He's hinted at about uh, how they are self-serving, and uh, again, they wanted to exalt themselves. Yet Christ is our example, and He certainly did not exalt Himself. You know, He didn't kind of lord over His godliness of other people, but He came as a humble servant. Um, so, in in the sense of being in the form of God, I believe that essentially, you know, He is the reflection of the Father. He's the essence. He's the of the same essence as God. Um, uh, it says where he, he, he did not consider it, uh, he, though he, it is not robbery to be equal with God. Um, and I think what it means, what robbery kind of means like, uh, like to, uh, to desire or to seize, you know, take by force. Um, you know, he, he and I think that's exactly what these false teachers are kind of doing. They're, they're trying to take by force because they, they had the gospel essentially. They were trying to, to. Uh, really rob these believers essentially of their financial um i think of their financial goods and of their uh just did they wanted to be served by these believers as opposed to serving god and that you know and jesus being our example did not do such a thing he didn't you know try to uh you know we, we know that he could have came in and um and his second coming he's coming as a conquering king but his first coming he was a humble servant serving others. And so uh, that's really what we, we, you know, I think that we should be equipped with the same mindset. Uh, again, like these false teachers, I think they they sought to, um, again, rob others, essentially, uh, to make, to, to elevate themselves, uh, to elevate their status. It were, again, Christ, Christ didn't do such, such quote-unquote robbery. Um, let me see here. This is a really a lot to um, unpack here. I think, I think I'm gonna stop there for now. We'll uh, give you guys me, a shot. Well, let me respond to your uh, your thoughts on the robbery part. Uh, um, I I think that the robbery should be understood 
that of ta taking something that doesn't belong to you. Uh, yes. So uh, it was it, Jesus uh, being uh, God, his claims of deity, uh, it was justified. He wasn't taking something that he didn't uh, was not entitled to. He is God. It is it is reasonable. It is the right thing to do. And, and there there's no uh, uh, you should not be charged with oh you're not really God. You're claiming you're God and you're just a man. Uh, no, it, he's not robbing God of of his identity. That he he's not entitled to that. Uh, that's how I think it. But Renee, let me get your thoughts on that before we get into the rest of it. Well, that was uh, uh, an idiom that I looked up. Um, thought it not robbery, and I think Ben uh, said it well. Um, let me let me show you how this guy puts it here. <clears throat> I agree with you also, Luke. I think when it says thought it not robbery, meaning that. He was aware of his deity, however, humbled himself uh, as not just the humblest of men, but as a servant and not just a servant, but a servant unto death and not just a death, but death, the most humiliating death, the death on the cross. So it's just building and building from glorious God and then showing his humility as he grows more and more and more. You see more and more and more humility to the death of the cross. But here, there was a Greek term. It says in ancient Greek, this was a common idiom, considering it robbery. Uh, the phrase has an idea of being grasped to or clung to, right? Jesus did not cling to the prerogatives or privileges of deity. So the way it's worded was an actual idiom. Whenever I run across things like that, I'll look it up. I don't like using commentaries too often, but uh, sometimes we'll see a, a form or a turn of phrase that either is symbolic or something we're not understanding in this modern age. So I thought it was interesting that there, there was an actual phrase. Uh, so to say did not consider it robbery meant that he did not cling to the privileges of God. He could just because they were his, he didn't cling to them, but uh, humbled himself in the form of a servant. Hmm. Well, I certainly agree. That's what he did. I just don't think that that part of the uh, scripture is, and that's what it means, but it's what right. your, your point that you made is, is a valid point. Uh, but what to me, when a robbery is, if I'm going to interpret the way I, I would interpret these words is, you know, hey, you're robbing, you're taking something that doesn't belong to you. Yeah, his, his claim of deity belongs to him. Yep, so I, he, didn't, he he's saying, all hey, right, I'm entitled to claim I'm God. I'm not robbing. Uh, I'm not taking something I'm, that I'm not really entitled to. That's but, exactly um, how I saw it, Luke. That's yeah. exactly how I've always seen it. I just thought it was interesting that that yeah. was an actual turn of phrase used commonly in Greek. Yeah, and I okay. agree with that too. Uh, I just think in the, I agree with that 100%. But I think in the context, the, his application is basically saying, he, you know, he didn't make, he wasn't trying to elevate his status and make a name for himself. Uh, he came to serve, you know, he didn't abuse his status as the son of God. He instead used his status as for the good of others. And yep. like Paul, Paul didn't come in and ask these people to Again, there's several epistles where he says, I didn't take anything from you, and uh, I, and I so that you would think that I'm taking advantage of you. I came in and, uh, you know, I, I served you. I served you, and so that you, you have you have no, I you can, there's nothing you can blame me for. Um, and I think that's kind of the sense we talk about here, that I, the, the yeah. uh, context is serving. And the, and the, I, the, I the, interpretation. The, the following the following verses that talk about him serving rather than uh, emphasizing his the, the deity or, is uh it's true but it doesn't cancel out or nullify the the earlier verse I think and the, the point that I made but uh, let's uh, Renee go ahead and uh, get your thoughts on the uh, the whole there's what we read six seven and eight together so uh -huh. go ahead and, and uh, explain all that, that to us yeah well I, I'd agree with you both. Uh, it isn't robbery because he is God. He's not taking uh, attributes that don't belong to him. 
but also I uh, was interested in seeing that it was a common turn of phrase. Um, and I agree here that he, let, let's read again. This mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God. So he's in, he's asking them to have the same sense of humility, to know our standing with God as beloved children of God, yet humble ourselves and be willing to serve the needs of others as Christ, our example, did. Because uh, it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. And by the way, these are great verses to prove that he's God and man and that he came in the form of a man, but not sinful flesh. He's God manifest in the flesh, uh, which is clearly said in another verse. But these are great verses for defending that uh, and, and you know, that God created a body for him and was made in the likeness of men and found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death of the cross. So the whole point here, and I agree with Ben, is that the mind should be in us like it was in Jesus, knowing who he was, yet being willing to serve others. And it just says the verse prior, let every man not think on his own things, but every man on the things of others. So uh, we should be thinking about others' needs and be willing to humble ourselves as a servant, which was the mind of Christ. And we're told that we uh, have the mind of Christ. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, Ben, you, you stopped really after verse 6, so why don't you go ahead and, and connect 6, 7, and 8 together now. Yeah, now, the, the more I look at this, I'm, I'm seeing kind of a pattern here. So, uh, with regards to the robbery, you know, um, he again, I, I think that I, the, the kind of theme that I'm seeing is that, you know, he, he, Paul is giving us basically three examples of how Christ uh, became the ideal servant. Um you know, the first was that he, you know, he didn't go around and say, "Hey, I'm son of God." You know, uh, you know, I'm better than everyone else. Essentially, you know, he didn't, he didn't, uh, he didn't, he didn't use that his position uh, in that way. He said he 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 put away all all um, prestige or position. He became a lowly servant, and then secondly, um, you know, he made himself of no reputation. Is that he 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 basically emptied himself in the sense that. Uh, you know, given his uh, divine stature and you know being the son of God, uh, he still he still willingly became a man and um, he became a, a, in the form of a bond servant. So he became like a slave under the law, just like everyone else. And again, he 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 didn't empty himself of his attributes, but he emptied himself of his status. Essentially, he again he didn't he didn't uh, try to rule over people in his first coming. Um, he came he came to serve, and so. Um, you know, he, he had a high position in heaven, uh, and, but yet he still came down to serve us and, 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 and became weak like us in, in terms of like in, in, the, in, his, in his humanity, his flesh. Um, and even, okay, so verse eight, uh, and even to the point where the death of the cross, he was obedient even to the death, onto the death of the cross. So he served his father perfectly and, he, and by doing, he served us. And so again, we should all have that, have that same likeness of mind. Um, we should never be looking self-seeking. We should always be looking for opportunity to serve others. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, th these verses uh, remind me of another verse that I've uh, you've heard me say many times when I present the gospel. Uh, and Jesus said that, do not think that I came to be served, but rather to serve and to give my life as a ransom for others or for many. Uh, so uh, Jesus is, is basically making the point that uh, even though he's God, he, his role and function in the incarnation is not really to be, rep, to be God, even though he is God and man. He came with the purpose of, of uh, um, serving and, and setting an example. He washed the feet of the apostles. That's the best example you can give. 
of a humble servant. And he said, if you want to be great, they were arguing about who, which one of the disciples or apostles would be the greatest. And he said, if you really want to be great, then you need to be the least. You like you need to serve others, and then you, then you'll be great in God's uh, eyes. Um, so he uh, he said, uh, okay. He came to serve and to die to give his life as a ransom. A ransom is a payment made to set someone free. So his death uh, serves as a payment for our sins to set us free from condemnation. Because scriptures say that you know, if, if you believe in Jesus, you're not condemned. But if you don't believe in Jesus, you're condemned already. So our natural state, the default for all humanity, is condemnation. That's the, that's the state that we're born in, that we, and that we're all in until it's resolved. So, um, but we're no longer condemned with our, with our faith in Jesus. Um, but I want to read these verses in the uh, Amplified, see how it's, they express it. Uh, 6, 7, and 8 says, uh, Who, although he existed in the form and unchanging essence of God. So that's that's saying that uh, prior to his incarnation, he existed uh, as God, in the form of God, And but the unchanging essence, the, that word essence uh, or substance is the, is the, that's the terminology that they came up with in these uh, uh, ancient councils. And when they wrote those creeds and uh, trying to define, express the Godhead, they're, they they said that uh, uh, he, they the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they're the same substance or essence. Uh, as one with him, possessing the fullness of all the divine attributes. So even though he has completely God, he has all the attributes of God, he's the actual essence or substance as God. The, the, he has the entire nature of deity, it says in the Amplified, but did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or asserted as if he did not already possess it or was afraid of losing it. So they're, they're basically saying this idea of what he's conveying there is that uh, uh, he didn't need to try to uh, like defend his, his, his deity. There was no need to do that. He did, uh, uh, regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or asserted. So uh, people maybe couldn't grasp it. And even today, even through all these centuries and all these efforts by theologians, and even as we attempt to express the Godhead in our own words, um, it's, uh, it, it's something that's very difficult to understand and express. So we do the best we can with it, but that's why uh, many times they just threw up their hands and, and, and said, it's a mystery. The Godhead, I mean, Jesus is fully God, fully man. There's th three persons in the Godhead, and yet it's still one God. This is a mystery. We explain it the best we can, but really, uh, we can't really grasp it. Uh, as if he did not already possess it, so um, or or was afraid of losing it. So uh, they're they're basically saying that uh, these things were not part of his his uh, his uh, thought process. There, he was really. Uh, what his really his purpose was and his mind was not on those things. He was not concerned with that as much as he was. I mean, he did def identify himself as God and he did defend himself as, as God. Uh, and, and there's a lot of his conversations in scriptures where you can clearly say that he, he's clearly claiming to be God and he's arguing for his Godhood. But um, his real mission was to... Um, Serve, as I said, example as a servant and to die for our sins, but emptied himself. Uh, emptying himself means that uh, this is how uh, Jesus, even though he's God, he set aside or emptied this. Um, I don't know how to express that either. This, this God's ability. In other words, he didn't seem to know everything. God's omniscience. But Jesus said, well, as far as the uh, what day or hour, uh, only the Father knows, the, not even the Son knows it. Uh, so there are, there are certain ways where he set aside, or as it says here, he emptied himself so that he didn't have all the ability that he has as God because he, he reduced himself and, and, and uh, brought, brought himself down to the level of a man so he could really, truly live as a man without just relying, just being able to use his 
godness uh, to to bail himself out. You know, if he's in a problem, he didn't just call. You know, use his powers to um, uh, get uh, solve his problem. He dealt with it as he as you would as a man. Uh, he says without renouncing or diminishing his deity, but only temporarily giving up the outward expression of divine equality uh, and his rightful dignity by assuming the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men. So in a way, uh, when it says likeness of men, I mean, we, of course, the, the, all the church fathers and historical theologians, they, 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 uh, they want us to believe and embrace this idea that he is fully God, at the same time fully man, and yet the scriptures are telling us that it's a likeness. In, in some ways, it's it's a likeness. It's not um, he, he's he's a man, but somehow it's it seems to be different. I don't know. Maybe you can clarify that for me. But I I, I don't think there's any way around it that it's saying that uh, he's in the form of God and the likeness of men. Uh, he became completely human, but was without sin, being fully God and fully man. So it seems that they were saying that uh, the reason that he's, um, 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 because he has no sin, that means that he's he can be completely human, but without sin. Uh, let me see, verse 8 in the Amplified says, after he was found in terms of his outward appearance as man, for the divinely appointed time, he humbled himself still further by becoming obedient to the Father to the point of death, even death on a cross. So, yeah, there is a lot. You're right, Ben. Uh, these three verses, if we wanted to really slow down, we could just say we're going no far further tonight. We're just going to uh, continue to talk about these three verses. I, I'm sure that we could do that, and it would it would be worthwhile. Okay, um, uh, there's some footnotes, but I've talked so much. Let me stop and see if you want to respond anymore, and then I can look at the footnotes. Nobody wants to say. Anything? Well, yeah, no. I think you. I think you're absolutely right. I think we've all kind of touched on very salient points where. Um, again, I think Paul is basically saying, you know, I, you know, look, look to Christ and follow my example, and I'm following Christ's example, or follow, just follow Christ's example. But uh, I'm also following Christ's example, and you know, we're not in it for ourselves. We're not, we're not in it for earthly glory. We're not doing doing it for earthly status, and, and neither did Christ. He didn't do it. He did it. He suffered uh, in this life. Or uh, and, and he suffered in the flesh so that he could be glorified in the spirit, essentially. And uh, I think we should have that same mindset that our glory is not on this earth. Um, we we in this in this lifetime we're here to uh, serve others, not not to make a name for ourselves or serves ourselves. Uh, like again, I think the influence of these uh, false teachers, he, in light of the false teachers who are uh, again serving themselves. Um, we, again, especially that Paul's gone now. They don't. They don't have his uh, his influence uh, to look at while he's in prison, uh, other than knowing that he's in prison and still speaking and, and thinking this way. And uh, you know, which is remarkable. Uh, he's not saying "Woe is me." He understands the role of suffering, uh, just as Christ knew the role of suffering in this life. It's to it. It leads to future glory. Um, and 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 again, the suffering is not necessarily. Uh, suffering for the sake of suffering, but suffering for the furtherance of, of the gospel and suffering, quote unquote, to serve others. You know, it's self denial. Yeah. Okay, uh, Renee, you want to say more about? Uh, well, six, seven, eight? I don't really have anything to add except that the whole uh, beginning of the letter works together. That they're like minded of one accord uh, to not do anything for vainglory do anything to promote yourself um and to to have lowliness of mind esteeming others better than themselves not thinking on his own things but every man think on the things of others and let this mind be in you 
which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God. So he he is saying they should all be like minded. And they should, like Ben said, follow him who is following the example of Christ. And and if anybody had the right uh, to be exalted, uh, it, it was Jesus because he was God. But he humbled himself so lowly for the cause of others, for our very salvation. And not just to give us to rescue us, but to bless us with an inheritance. And so we should have that same mind to look for others to be blessed, to look for others' needs to be fulfilled. That is the mind of Christ, to be caring more for what others' needs are than even our own. Okay, uh, all right. I know I've uh, said a lot already, but I do wanna just see if there's anything of value in the footnotes I see here in the NABRE. So I'll read, there's a footnote for six and seven. It says either, verse six is either a reference to Christ's preexistence and those aspects of divinity that he was willing to give up in order to serve in human form or to what the man Jesus refused to grasp at to attain divinity. Uh, many see an allusion to the Genesis story, unlike Adam. Uh, Jesus, though, in the form of God, did not reach out for equality with God in contrast with the first Adam. Well, that's an interesting point there. Uh, and ver verse 7, the footnote says, taking the form of a slave coming in human likeness, uh, they interpret that as, or they elaborate on that, or taking the form of a slave that is coming in human likeness and found human in appearance. While it is common to take Philippians 2, 6 and 7 as dealing with Christ's preexistence and Philippians 2, 8 with his incarnate life, so that that lines up with 2, 7b uh, and 7c are parallel. It is also possible to interpret uh, so as to exclude any reference to preexistence uh, and to take Philippians 2, 6 through 8 as presenting two parallel stanzas about Jesus's human state in the latter alternative, coming in human likeness begins the second stanza in parallel 6a to some extent. Well, there's a lot there. It's, it's a very complicated portion of scriptures, I would say, but uh, what really, uh, uh, I, I, I don't want to say confounds me, but I'm, I'm curious. I wish I had a better explanation or maybe someone could help me. Uh, uh, I'm just curious when, when the, the church, uh, the Orthodox position is that Jesus in the carnation was simultaneously fully God and fully man. And that, Yet we know here it, in these verses, it says that he it was in the form of God and that he was in the likeness of man. So maybe uh, if anybody has any thoughts on that, let me know. Otherwise, I'll move on. That's what I was saying, that those are great verses to say he wasn't just a man because people are saying he came in the, you know, this clearly says he came in the form of a man, fashioned as a man in the likeness of man. So I, I think these are important verses. Yeah, there's other verses that say he he, he uh, came in the likeness of sinful flesh. So uh, again, he, he, he became, as a man, he became a fully man in nature. Uh, so he could, he could, again, take our sins away. Um, and, and the appearance, obviously, you know, he, he looked, he became man as, as his appearance in the sense that, you know, he, he looked exactly like us. He didn't look like, you wouldn't look at him I think it says in Isaiah that you know, the, there's nothing in him that would, in his appearance, that would make us to desire him. You know, uh, there's no comeliness. Um, he didn't have any visual or, or uh, appearance-wise, he didn't have any splendor or glory in his first incarnation. Uh -huh. Well, there's a verse, I think it's in Colossians, 
where it talks about uh, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Uh, does anybody know where that is? I thought that was in this chapter, isn't it? Uh, later down? I thought it was in Colossians, but maybe I'm wrong. Renee, do you know where that is, where it talks about the fullness of the Godhead bodily? Uh, John, um, in him, do I, no, it's not. I'll have to look it up. I'll find it right now. Yeah, yeah I, I just searched for it, but it didn't, didn't come up. Fullness of the Godhead. Well, Colossians 2 9. Yeah. Colossians 2 9. Yeah, for in him dwell all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then in one of the pastoral epistles, it says God was manifest in the flesh. Uh -huh. Why isn't it coming up on my search? I wrote in fullness of the Godhead bodily in the King James, and it's it's not showing. Huh. What verse is it? Colossians, Colossians 2 9. Colossians 2. I'm just looking at 2 so I get the context. 2 9. Uh, it says, uh, For in him dwell all the fullness that God had bodily, period, and ye are complete in him. Okay, I thought, I thought that that verse not only said that, but elaborated further the way these three verses uh, did uh, to, that we were discussing earlier. Okay, so <clears throat> all right. Do you see my? Uh, do you see my kind of my uh, confusion? Is that uh, we we know that it, he has the fullness of the Godhead bodily. We know that the theologians uh, fought and 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 uh, declared eventually that he was fully God and fully man. And then we see that the verses says that he was in the form of God in the likeness of men. And uh, so it, it, uh, I'm not sure how to make those uh, make that all that work. All right, let's move on. Since uh, okay, um, Ben, would you read verse uh, nine? Wow. Uh, yeah. Nine and ten. Yeah, nine, ten, and eleven. Read that for Renee, okay? Okay, uh, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And let me just turn the page here. Uh, under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay, hey, Renee. Yes. Well, you know what this reminds me of here is where it says, wherefore, wherefore what? Because he was God, yet he humbled himself as a man and became a servant and died. And then not just died, but died the horrific death on the cross. Wherefore. God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. And Ben hinted toward this earlier, but Luke 14, 11 says, For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So it's when you humble yourself that God elevates you. But when you try, like it says through vainglory here, to try to elevate yourself, you'll be knocked down because this works different. God's kingdom, spiritual kingdom works different, opposite the world. The world says the more you huff and puff about yourself and show off, the world will elevate you. Everybody gets to see your works and they all praise you and they love you. That's why it says, hmm, when the world likes you, be leery of that because it loves its own. But in God's kingdom, the more you belittle yourself, the more you're elevated. It, it would not make sense to the way this world works that you now there's people that 
feign humility, that pretend humility in order to exalt themselves, but that's just manipulation. This is about literally humbling yourselves with a sincere heart to serve God and help another, put another's needs before your own. That's when God exalts you. Hey, Renee, would you would you admit that nobody is more humble than me? <laughs> I knew this Buddhist guy. All he ever talked about was, I am the most humble person. And I was like, can you hear yourself? Like, you are literally boasting about being humble. Very funny. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, and the verse after you stopped at, to the glory of God the Father. So it's 11, right? 9, that 10, and 11. So uh, that's the concept that comes uh, to me uh, when I hear that God so highly exalted him, given him a name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, the Lord, divine, not just Lord and Master of your life. That's not what Lord means in the context of scripture. He is the Lord, name above all names, divine. And so I, I love this in the Godhead that the Father elevates Jesus above all things to his own glory. So even in the Godhead, serving, giving, elevating another glorifies them it's it's just awesome how this works and so this is an example here that since jesus humbled himself look how greatly he's elevated and so he is our example once again that we should serve the lord have the mind of christ be humbled serve others and god in heaven will see it it means something to him and he will exalt us. That's why he says the first will be last and the last will be first. Although I also believe the context of that is the first was Israel. The last were the Gentiles. They were the last, you know, but that was switched. So the last, those that didn't belong to God would be first in the kingdom. So, but I also believe the context there is first, last, last, first. Those that seem to be somewhat as paul puts it those that seem to be somewhat those would be last but the 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 smallest thing like the widow with the widow's might that was a great gift because that's all she had that she would be elevated that the uh this concept is completely foreign to the ways of this world yeah, the, there's the account of the Good Samaritan. That's a picture of this too. But Ben, yeah. uh, do you uh, uh, six, uh, seven, eight? I mean, nine, ten, and eleven. Now, there's a lot there, um, like the last three verses, but not quite as much. But you know, you know me. I I always like to go through like one verse at a time. But the way this Paul wrote, and the way that whoever did the uh, translating and then the publishing the punctuation and the, the thoughts that sometimes we're forced to take on a whole bunch of content together and then it puts us in a position where there's so much in there so there's it's really quite a challenge ben are you are you ready 9 10 and 11. well renee expertly uh answered it and uh, you know i don't have a lot to add to what she said but if you think about the you know the 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 depth of the humiliation that Christ went through in terms of his, you know, being stripped naked uh, on the cross. I sometimes wonder, I don't know if you guys have any insight, but I wonder if he was fully naked. You know, a lot of times in the pictures you see him, he's wearing something around his, his loins, but I wonder if he was not just fully naked. Either way, it was not, it, 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 you know, from the world's perspective, an honorable death. It was a shameful death from the world's perspective. Um, and in fact, uh, that kind of ties into here too, is that, you know, People, a lot of people would say, uh, you know, Christians are, are shameful in their, in their humility in terms of, you know, you know, oh, who wants to live like a Christian? They they, they live so, uh, 
such boring lives, and, you know, such moderation, and they don't like to do, they don't like to have fun or whatever. Um, and so, again, in that sense, they uh, they they think that you know it, it's a humiliating life or a, a worthless life. Um, but again, like like Renee said, that uh, humiliation and serving others in this life. It, it, we're not going to get the. We're not making a name for ourselves in this life. We're not going to be. Uh, don't expect us to be exalted in this life. Just the very. Just the opposite. But in the age to come, we we will be glorified. And and like I Renee caught caught this too. I thought it was interesting that even Christ, again in 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 keeping with the idea of serving others, he did not seek his own glory. He sought the glory of his Father. So he sought the in his obedience, and his humility. He sought the glory of others, not only the Father, but He also will glorify us for those who believe in Him. Um, so again, I think it's it's not only Paul's teaching that it's it's important to be Christ-like uh, in this life to serve others, but there, but in the in the in the sense of um, exaltation, they won't don't expect it in this life, but it in the age to come, that's when our uh, uh, we expect can expect to be exalted. Um, that's one other thing I was going to say, and I don't remember what it was now. Oh, oh, well, well, uh, okay. The uh, ultimately, at the all of creation will uh, bow to him, you know. Um, and and so, gosh, I had such a great thought. What was it? <laughs> I come back. I'll I'll think of it, and I'll 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 uh, I'll leave it at that for now. You need a notepad. That's what I do, so I don't forget. Yeah, my thought. I know. Look at this. You see this? How many times do you have to keep saying that? Your name's right. You're, you're gonna, it would be very, very helpful if you have your notepad and pens as you're listening. Uh, make your notes so that when it's your turn. Oh, I was going to say. I, I remember. Okay. okay. Oh, the other thing I think part of this, too, is that, you know, um, I think, you know, a lot of people, uh, especially the prosperity uh, movement, uh, they, they, you know, they consider it all of a sudden of God. So God doesn't God doesn't want his sons, you know, living in in poverty. I expect that you know God God wants us to have, fa have fancy cars and have fancy lifestyles. God wants the best for his children, and they're just blind uh, to the idea of you know they they again they're they're short sighted and blind. They're seeing earthly glory. They're seeking earthly glory and not eternal glory. And again, they 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 said again they they consider themselves as son of God. They they think they deserve all these things just because they're son of God. And, and, and this revert these verses are, are refuting that Jesus was the, the Son of God, and and again he didn't uh, seek after those he didn't use that status uh, to you know um, he did uh, use that status to just uh, have people serve him. Um, Great point. He came to serve. So. Great point. That is complete opposite of the attitude. When you're done, uh, Luke, I wanted to point something out. Someone said. Okay. All right. Uh, it'll be a while. This I've got a lot to say about. Do you, do you need to make the point quickly, or is because I've got to take a while for me to get through these three verses? It was just something in chat. It's a uh, switch. Put a great verse that confirms Jesus is the Old Testament God. It says, "I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return." To me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. Isaiah 45, 23. That proves Jesus is God. He is the God in Isaiah. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. It is the same exact thing that is said that is going to happen for Jesus. So mm -hmm. it's just another verse proving yeah, he's God. I, I didn't, I wasn't aware of that verse, but... Uh, and take a vow. I bet you there's some translations that interpret it as confess. Yeah, confess. Take another yeah. thing. Very good. Uh, thank you. Who gave us that switch? Switch. Yep. Yeah. Very good. Um, okay. Um, I, my street preaching. You know, I always we spent quite a while talking about these verses here. But uh, let me. In the KJV it says, "Wherefore God hath also exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name." First of all, um, I'm one that uh, uh, I get very aggravated when I hear anybody just saying God, the word God, rather than Jesus. And maybe I'm uh, take it too far. 
No, but, I'm with you. But the, the name that is above all names is Jesus. Yep. Uh, and, and that, uh, I, I would say that's above the Father and even the Holy Spirit. I mean, according to this, if it's above all names, it is above all names. And so why? Why is it above all names? Well, it, it, it literally translates to God saves. Yep. So the gospel is in Jesus' name. Yep. So it's a, it's a, a, he is a, that that name is making him God and Savior at the same time. Yep. Uh, but um, um, there are people that uh, I, they don't like to use the name of Jesus. Why? Well, Jesus said that um, if, when you mention his name, be prepared. There's going to cause division. He said that uh, uh, over him that. Uh, uh, they, let me see, father uh, against son, husband against wife. Uh, there, there will be, um, what is it? There's two different ways of saying it. There will his name will cause division or uh, the take take up swords or something. I forgot. Can anybody remember that point I'm talking about? I know what you're talking about, but I don't know where it is. I'll look for it. Yeah, okay. Um, so... It, if, if people want to just talk about God generically rather than saying the name of Jesus, uh, I believe that the, whether they are thinking about it or it's a subconscious thing, they know that it's safe to, to mention God, but it's not safe to mention Jesus. Because when it. you mention Jesus, what is it, sister? It is Luke 12, and it says, The father shall be divided against the son, the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And by the way, this is mentioned in another place as well. It's one of the other synoptic gospels uh, in a similar telling of the same story. Uh, in this place, Jesus says, I didn't come to bring peace, but yes. division. And in another spot, it says, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. Yeah, so that's exactly right. I don't know why, since I've said that verse like a thousand times in my life, why does it leave my mind right now? I don't get it. But uh, yeah, so he, he did not come to bring uh, peace, but a sword. He did not come to bring peace, but division. Everybody will divide over the name of Jesus. And so, uh, it, and even, even we identify ourselves as Christians. Well, I identify myself as a Christian. Because I don't want anybody to be uh, wonder what I'm talking about. I'm talking about I'm identifying with Christ. Christ is my focal point. He's my Savior. I'm relying entirely on Christ. So be, let there be no confusion. When I'm not going to say Christ. And uh, I, I want anybody to know this is about Christ. And so his name is above all names, the name Jesus. And, uh, and then it says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Uh, of things in heaven, of things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue uh, should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord for the glory of God the Father. So um, there is going to come a point uh, that, uh, I, and I would always say in my, my preaching, that look, at some point, you're going to get on your knees, and you're going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It says that. The Bible's true. It's if it's written, it's it's true. Uh, you're going to can get on your knees and confess Jesus as Lord. Why not? Why wait until it's too late? Because I don't think this is talking only about believers. It says every knee should bow. I think that all people who have ever lived, there's going to come a point in time where we believers and non-believers alike can say Jesus is Lord. Uh, and they're going to confess it. They're going to admit it. That okay, even though I rejected him my whole life, even though I mocked Christianity and uh, I refused uh, to, to, to even listen or believe the gospel and receive the gift of eternal life, and now I'm doomed. It, by the way, it is too late. Once that time comes, if if you're if you're not confessing Jesus Christ as Lord as we do, that hey, we believed and we got saved and we admitted He's Lord back when we were breathing. Uh, and so, but if those people who will not admit it, but wait till that time off in the future, at some point where we're all together and every knee shall bow and confess Jesus Christ is Lord. But the, the universalists will take this and say, see, every knee at some point is going to say Jesus is Lord. And that's when 
universalism kicks in and because, okay, they didn't do it while they're alive, but at some point they're going to acknowledge him as Lord and therefore they're all going to be saved. Uh, but that's, uh, that's twist in the verses. It doesn't say that anything about them being saved because they did this at that point in time. It just says that they're going to have to get on their knees and confess it's true. Um, so I, I just think that uh, one, uh, we should make sure that we're using the name of Jesus in our conversations. Don't cower and just talk about God generically. Uh, you're, you're, if you're a Christian, if you're saved because of Jesus Christ, then use his name, identify with his name. And then of course, uh, uh, if you haven't uh, acknowledged Jesus as your uh, God and Savior, Lord, that, that, you, you, you're you going to do it at some point. How foolish it would be to reject Jesus your entire life and then in the end to re realize that it was all true, but it's too late for me. Don't wait. Don't don't delay. Uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved right now. Uh, all right. Uh, do you want to say more, uh, Ben or, or Renee, about uh, 9, 10, and 11? Okay, I'm going to read them in the Amplified just so I can see how they express it. It says, uh, for this reason, he also, because he obeyed and so completely humbled himself, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in submission of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess and openly acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, that is sovereign God, to the glory of God the Father. I'm glad that they interpreted Lord as sovereign God rather than master, because uh, that's where the lordshippers go wrong, where they say that uh, uh, they try to interpret some of these verses when it says Lord to, to support their Lordship heresy, whereas it should be understood that Lord, especially when we see it capitalized, it, it, it's, it's clearly t talking about the deity of Christ, not, not, not his Lordship in that he's, uh, he's the boss. He's Amen. the Lord of your life. Amen. Okay. Uh, let me see if there's a footnote on any of those verses here. Nine, ten. Nine says the name Lord, uh, revealing the true nature of the one who is named. Uh, and then ten it says every knee should bend, every knee tongue confess. In this language of Isaiah 45, 3, it says, by myself I swear, uttering my just decree, a word that will not return to me, every knee shall bow. Is that the one you cited earlier, Renee? Uh, sounds Isaiah, like Isaiah 45, 23. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, yeah, they're acknowledging that verse also. Um, so both the NABRE and Renee both referenced this, that uh, and I, I was unaware of that verse. It's not that I'm unaware because I haven't read it. I mean, I've read through the Bible many times, but I certainly have forgotten more than I know. Unfortunately, there has been inserted a reference to the three levels in the universe, according to ancient thought, heaven, earth and under the earth. OK, but I think that does support the, the claim I made that when it says every knee shall bow, it's not only talking about the believers, it's talking about every person who's ever lived and even all beings, all creatures, everything, of all kinds. They'll acknowledge that he is God. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we ready to go on to uh, 12. Um, Renee, why don't you read 12 for, uh, or I'm, I don't remember whose turn it is, but is it right you should read it and then bet for Ben? Or is it the other way? All right. Go ahead, read 12 for Ben. Okay. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I love this one. Yeah, this is the, another favorite Lordship verse. Um, well, yeah, I, I, it's pretty uh, straight up, up front. I mean, it, it's pretty uh, straightforward uh, where Paul says, uh, you know, just as when he was there, they were obedient to his to his doctrine. 
Um, they should also be obedient when he when he is um, when he's not with them, and and the work out your own salvation uh, with fear and trembling. Again, I think many people have said this before. You know, if I say I'm going to go work out my uh, my arms today at the gym, it's I I have the arms, so it's not like I'm, I'm working for my salvation. It's salvation that I already possess, and I'm working it out. I'm making it stronger. I'm strengthening it. Uh, and how do you strengthen it? Well, it's it's by a beating, a, abiding in in sound doctrine, abiding in God's word, and uh, again following, following the you know not only hearing the word but doing it. Uh, be doers of the word. Um, uh, so again, that that that's the, again that's kind of parallel with what his uh, admonition is to for obedience. You know, don't just. Don't just uh, you know, let your don't let your muscles, so to speak, your spiritual muscle uh, atrophy. We should always be working it out to strengthen it. Um, and um, let me see here. Anything else I wanted to say? And essentially, you know, again, just keep on working for working for Christ. Um, and it's it's really. Um, let me see how far did we get. Just that one verse. Okay, just twelve. Okay, I think yeah, I'd stop there then. I'll stop there. Okay. Well, Renee, uh, you, you're known, you're known worldwide as the untwisted sister. And this verse and many it like it, that's your specialty. Worldwide. So I'm, very, I'm very, very eager to hear your teaching on this first sister. Well, I hope chat room's listening because, man, do I love this. Because so many people say, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Paul is referencing the Old Testament. And it's beautiful because the Psalms tell us how to work our inner salvation outward. How to make it a living faith, as James would say, to paraphrase him. Let's look. So Paul tells us to obey, not just in his absence, uh, not just when he's with him but in his absence to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. As Ben pointed out, you have to have salvation to work it out, your inner salvation outward. Psalms 2 tells us how to work out our salvation. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little, Blessed are all that put their trust in him. Do you love it? Do y'all love that or what? This verse is telling you to trust Christ, serve him and rejoice. Kiss the son, lest he be angry. So you receive Christ, you serve him and rejoice because of it. That is how you work your salvation out with fear and trembling. You know, people put private interpretations on these verses and instead of edifying and confirming what a great savior we have, they stir up a bunch of fear, all based on a wrong doctrine because they don't understand that the Old Testament and the fulfillment of Old Testament serve the Lord with fear, rejoice with trembling, kiss the son lest he be angry. And you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. In who? The Son. The Son. Beautiful stuff there. Thank you, Sister. Well, I, um, I looked ahead. I was just curious. Uh, I read the Amplified. And I'm really quite happy with the way that what they've done with it. Uh, I was a little bit worried because <laughs> the Amplified, many times it's very helpful, uh, but once in a while we discover a lordship element in there, just like we, we find in a lot of the modern translations. But let me read it in the Amplified um, and see what everybody thinks. It says, uh, so then, my dear ones, just as you have always obeyed, and it, they say, my instructions with enthusiasm, so they're interpreting this, not obeying like the commandments or the Lord or anything. He said, you're obeying my instructions. Okay, Enthusiasm so, equals joy. You think about it. Yeah. 
Uh, so he's ta Paul's talking about you're, you've obeyed my instructions. So this Paul's instructions certainly has nothing to do with obeying Paul's instructions for salvation. And of course, we we know that we believe the gospel that Paul taught, but but uh, all Paul's instructions are are not there for our salvation. Uh, so uh, this says not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. Continue to work out your salvation. That is cultivate it, bring it to full effect, actively pursue spiritual maturity with awe-inspired fear and trembling, using serious caution and critical self-evaluation to avoid anything that might offend God or discredit the name of Christ. I believe that the, the way that they, uh, they said uh, uh, working out your salvation is to cultivate it, bring it to full effect, actively pursue spiritual maturity. Sister Renee, isn't that what we're always talking about? That uh, these things are for, to teach us how to mature, not, not to get salvation? Yeah, you can't. You can't grow. You can't move. You can't do anything until you know that you're God's child and you're on the right foundation. You can't build on a wrong foundation. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also I thought of Hebrews too, where it said, you know, one of the things of Hebrews is, uh, pressing on to maturity, and he says we have, and, and he warns them it's important that you press on to maturity. Uh, not, not, it's not going to affect your salvation if you don't. But these are things that accompany salvation. So, uh, you know, not that they always go together, but th they should go together. You know, salvation and growth after salvation is God's expectation for every believer. Um, not every believers do, do that, and so they may only grow to a certain point and then backslide and, and whatever, but uh, our, our our trajectory should be up and up. You know, we should be constantly growing in the Lord. And the way we grow is by abiding in the word and being firmly established in that grace. That's our, that's our root. That's our water source. Sounds like you're uh, like on borderline of, of, of talking about that parable of the sower again. Uh, I don't think I've heard Renee talk about it. I, I, I'm pretty sure I know how she would interpret it. But Renee, on the parable of the sower, it, it is talking about what we're, we're saying here is that uh, 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 there are varying uh, de descriptions of a believer in terms of how they, they become productive or not productive. How, how do you see the parable of the sower? Uh, yeah. uh, do you see one of the groups saved or three of the groups saved? Well, here's the thing, if you want to apply it to salvation, but I think it's about uh, how very few actually go on to serve the purpose of God. Uh, and that uh, the only one that's not saved is the one that did not believe. Because that parable is listed in at least two of the synoptic gospels. And one of them clearly says, lest they be, uh, lest they believe and be saved. And it says that each one of them believed for a while and then something happened. They got either worried, carried away with the worries, or they got uh, thinking about the pleasures of the world, or uh, they actually took root and grew and branches came out and other such stuff. Uh, so uh, I think the point of that is uh, not so much to say this person's saved, this person's not, but to say how few there are that actually go on to maturity to serve the Lord and, and what a blessing and a rare thing it is to achieve that place. So, um, yeah, I would say all of them were saved except the, the one that did not believe because the criteria for salvation where there was lest they believe and be saved, not lest they believe and uh, spring up fruit and produce and all that and be saved. It was the, the thing was they had to believe to be saved. And then once they believed, then the issue was growth in the parable, I thought. So I think it's three of the four were saved. Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the only reason I'm uh, referencing it uh, uh, as uh, of the subject of salvation is because um, it's such a uh, there. I think that almost everybody I've ever encountered agrees that 
the first seed that fell by the wayside and was snatched away, uh, the seed never sprang to life, so it was never regenerated and saved. But the other three, all three of those seeds, I believe that since they sprang to life, that's a picture of the new birth and regeneration. But what happened after the spring seed came to life? Some, uh, after a while, that you know, it withered, and because of persecution or trials and so on, that's the that's the shallow ground and the thorny soil. So those are the people that, even though they got saved, they never really ended up growing and maturing and becoming fruitful like the last group. So I, I think it is it is really primarily about. Um, Hey, uh, not everybody's going to become as productive, but that should be our objective. However, there are those, and you know, the people that we used to work so closely with, they teach that no, that shows that those people were not truly saved, uh, that 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 were uh, in the thorny soil and the shallow ground. MacArthur is the same thing. He <laughs> says the only person that was saved was the one that bore fruit the perseverance of the saints. You know, he sees everything through the eyes of Calvinism anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. In regards to salvation, I believe the three of the four. I mean, what argument could you have against it? What argument could you have to say that uh, only the one was saved? Because not every Christian goes on to maturity. If that was the case, then why does Peter tell us to add this to our face and then this to our faith if it just automatically happened? And why does Hebrews say, let us not uh, let us go on to perfection if God permit? Well, wouldn't God permit every person to go on to perfection? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. You're right. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay. We've got, uh, let me see. We started about 11 minutes late. So we got about 14 minutes left. So let me see. I think we got time for our summaries and also uh, maybe another verse. Let's look at 13 and see. Uh, yeah. Let's, let's read 13. Uh, ben, why don't you read 13 for Sister Ray? Okay. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Mm -hmm. Renee? I'm so sorry I had to step away for just a second. I, I can go. You want me to go, Luke? No, no, read it again for her, please. Okay. Uh, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Sounds like Renee might have to step out for a little bit longer. Uh, probably I'm the same. I'm sorry. We had a thermostat issue, you guys. I had okay. to step away for a second. So uh, it's it's the 13. Yeah. God. Yeah. So uh, we just finished how Paul's telling them uh, to obey, whether in his absence or presence, and to work out our own salvation. That's his. Uh, and by the way, that's his point. Your own self. Even if I'm not there, it's your responsibility. That's the point. Or I got your own salvation with fear and trembling, which we know is to serve the Lord with fear, rejoice with trembling, kiss the son, lest he be angry, and whosoever trusts in him will not be ashamed. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So um, uh, when he says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, I think he's saying allow God to do his work and serve his purpose in you. Since there is, uh, that's your purpose. You belong to him. And he's the one that does the work in you. Mm -hmm. yeah. People use that though, guys. Mm -hmm. They use that to add their works though. They're very sneaky. They'll say, well, uh, uh, I know I'm saved because I do this and this and I repented of my sin. And when you tell them, wait a minute, that's your works. What? No, it's not. It's God doing it in me. See, they can use that also. To support. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They'll use this reference that it's God, you know, doing a work in us. So therefore, even though they're boasting in their works, they're not really boasting because it's God doing it. So it can be used in the opposite way as well. It shouldn't be, but yeah. yeah. All right, Ben. Uh, well, 
Yeah, so if, for it is God that worketh in you both to will and do his good pleasure. Yeah, I think I also hear this used by Lord Chipper saying, see, it's not me doing the works. Uh, b believers will persevere in the faith and in good works, but it's not me doing it. See, this verse says it's God that's doing it in me. And uh, to an extent that's true, I mean, but it's also uh, misleading. I believe God does with the Holy Spirit, g does give us, put us in his, gives us new desires um, uh, and, and guides us. It, the Holy Spirit never leaves us, but it's a constant guide to us. But a lot of people uh, quench the Holy Spirit. Um, and it, that, that can happen a couple different ways. When it can happen through persecution or through, um, you know, the lusts of, of this world, the, you know, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, those type of influences. The world can taint our thinking and get off, get get our minds off the word of God. But I, I believe God does give us a desire. I know for me, for example, after I, I got saved, I had a, just a, and I still have this, um, just a, a, a devouring appetite for his word. I want to understand everything. And when I don't understand something, it just drives me crazy in a good way. It just keeps it keeps me like I gotta find out. I gotta find out. But at the same time, you know, I could. I think some people uh, would say, uh, "No, yeah, I, I'm interested. I have that interest. God gave me that interest in, in His Word, but it's a lot of work. It's gonna take me a lot of you know, long many hours of study. And I really just play video games, you know, or something. I mean, there's a lot of different ways. So I think uh, God gives us a Spirit with new desires, uh, but it's up to us to yield to it. Um, it, our, our, you know, to to will, yield our will to it, and uh, and when we do, again, that's when God's work. That's when we bear fruit. We don't produce fruit, but we bear fruit. We allow the Holy Spirit's influence to take its course in our lives. We, we you know, we we are constantly uh, setting our minds on the things of the Spirit and to let us to guide us. Uh, but that doesn't happen for all believers, and even believers that want to do such things, I think it takes a while to learn that. I think Paul, that's what Paul's struggle was. In Romans 6, 7, and 8, essentially, you've come to terms with yielding to the Spirit as opposed to trying to please God by cranking out the Christian life in his flesh. Um, and I know for me in particular, I've struggled with that. And um, and again, I think, I think it more, it, 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 it's, it's all faith. You know, you, every moment, it's, it's a Christian life is a moment by moment walk of faith. And it's easy to, um, you know, it's 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 not it's easy to get bucked off your horse. Essentially, you know, uh, there's so many different influences that are constantly, uh, you know, so many things that want our our attention, and um, it's really easy to lose focus. And I think that's why Jesus said, for example, let your eye be single. You know, be singularly focused on things of the spirit. Um, uh, and again, I don't think this verse is at all teaching that um. That God, it, God, God is guaranteeing that um, you know He's going to work in you and use you. Just, I, I think it's kind of used in the same vein as it, not, not the word vein, the same sense that it was used in chapter one, where uh, we talked about um, that. Uh, I'm confident that God is going to. Well, I forgot what that verse was. It was. Uh, I'm confident that God's going to. Uh, what was it? Go ahead, go ahead, Luke. I'll, I'll think of it. <laughs> It was okay. one. Yeah. All right. Are you, do you, you, you were going to continue or you want me to go? All right. Give me one second to look this up. Uh, we talked about last time. Um, oh, geez. We talk, remember it was a big breakthrough. You said, oh, yeah, I think I, I think what you, you mentioned was a, uh, was what the sense of it was where he's thinking them. Um, I think you said something. Something was a matter of degrees. That's what I remember. But okay, uh, I'm going to read right. yeah. 14 and amplify while you're thinking here. For it is not your strength, but it is God who is effectively at work in you, both to will and to work. That is strengthening, energizing, and creating in you the longing and the ability to fulfill your purpose for his good pleasure. Yeah, uh, it, we, there are people, as Renee said, that, that will take verses like this and, and uh, uh, twist it for their purpose, uh, like the, 
supporting lordship and and uh, uh, but really there, there's nothing wrong with uh, with it acknowledging that uh, what we do um, if, if we are uh, willing to listen to the Holy Spirit and surrender as that really should be our objective but it's it's not so easy I mean some people maybe have succeeded completely but uh, mo the best m most of us can hope for is that we surrender more and more in terms of saying, Lord, your will be done in my life instead of me doing my thing and me, uh, you know, but let's cons call on the Lord and ask the Holy Spirit to, to teach us and guide us. And uh, when we do that, then it truly is the Lord working in us for his purpose rather than we're doing things, but the Lord's not really in it. It's it's our own initiative, our own thoughts. It's, it didn't come from the Holy Spirit. So uh, I, I think it certainly is uh, important and, and, and a truth that uh, the ideal is to uh, listen to the Holy Spirit. And, and, uh, and then in that case, what you're doing certainly is the will of God. Okay, Ben? Yeah, I was going to say, uh, remember, if you're in Philippians 1, uh, verse uh, 6, it said, remember, we talked about being confident of this very thing, that he has begun a good work in you, will complete into the day of Jesus Christ. I was saying that I don't, I personally don't believe, after studying this carefully, that, um, and I'm not alone in this, uh, there's other people who would agree, um, that uh, that verse is not teaching that God's guaranteeing that, you know, uh, God, God's going to use you to the end of your life, even if you're, you know, complete, complete rebellion, or that if, if, uh, if you don't persist in good works, then, the, then Christ might not, must have not be doing those good works in you, and so you, he, the work must have never begun in you to begin with. Um, where I, I believe again, being confident of this very thing that He has begun a good work in you will complete until the day of Jesus Christ. He's referring to their monetary. Uh, their financial and spiritual support of him. And he's speaking to this church corporately, and he's saying, "I, I because you, this church, you guys were the only church to support me. Um, I believe that, you know, again, God's the gospel is not going to die out with me, and this is not going to die with me or with you. Um, even though I'm in prison, it's going to continue on. Uh, your support will not be in vain. God will use it, and uh, I think that maybe that could be the same sense." He's using it there in verse 13. But it could be very, you know, so in other words, he's speaking corporately. But I also believe, uh, you know, there's definitely an application, uh, if not the primary meaning, uh, is individual. All right. Sister Ray, you would, would you like to say anything more about verse 13? No. Okay. All right, then. Let's stop there. Uh uh, now we have a few minutes left to, to summarize, and uh, we will have gotten our 90-minute uh, program, even though we started late and finished late, but it still it worked out. Uh, uh, go, uh, ben, let's let's start with you. Give us uh, give us your uh, summary th thoughts, your closing remarks about the study. Um, I think again it was like it was a good 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 study. Um, I you know we could we could have. Uh, we could have really spent all, all all the whole program on it, just a couple of those verses because there's so much that could be um, so much more that could be said about them. Uh, but I think we I think we did a good job of covering the basics um, in in the general flow and refuting some lordship interpretations, uh, which I think it should be helpful, hopefully helpful to some that are uh, you know uh, deceived by that false doctrine. So. Um, it was a very worthwhile study. I, I, I got some great insight from you guys, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys uh, Friday. Okay, great. Friday, fun Fellowship Friday. I'm sure a lot of people are looking forward to that. Okay, Sister Renee? Yeah, I was thinking, man, there's so much covered in tonight's study. We've got the deity of Christ, how he manifested uh, in the form of a man, he was man and God. So we've covered his uh, uh, dual personages and uh, as well as um, uh, spiritual maturity and growth and how uh, we're exalted. Those who 
uh, humble themselves or be exalted and vice versa. Uh, the mind of Christ, putting others uh, before ourselves uh, sincerely. And, as Ben said, refuting what Lord Shippers try to use to tear down instead of edify, uh, to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, with reverence and awe for God, serving and rejoicing as we kiss the sun. So, um, and it is God uh, that works in us. We, we discussed so much here tonight. Uh, I want to say thank you for the verses you guys posted and the amazing comments you put in chat about the study tonight. Uh, and I also want to add, um, some of you may not know this, but we have uh, a list that we've given the moderators for Sunday and Wednesday that are very strict. And so uh, they may be dealing with an issue um, that you're not aware of. So we ask that you don't correct a moderator when they're doing their job. And if you see a disagreement or something you thought was not right, to please wait till after, and then we're happy to discuss it. Um, we can, you can post something at the end of it and, and we can set a, a meeting or something to discuss any error you may see. But for now, we've gone through the details of what we'd like to see to keep order, because you guys know we had trolls and stuff, but also because some people weren't able to pay attention to the study because there's so much other crosstalk and stuff happening. So uh, they've been given some strict measures uh, of rules uh, in there. So if you weren't aware of them, they may be dealing with something you didn't know about. So I wanted to let you know that. But if you do have an issue with something a moderator has done or you thought it was unjust or unfair, we can discuss that uh, after but um, not during. Okay, guys, thank you so much. Okay, awesome. Uh, do you have a program tomorrow night, Renee? I do not, because I had set up guests for the first couple of weeks. I am not certain if I'm gonna have a group of panelists uh, for a topic yet, or if I'm gonna get another guest. I just really haven't been able to figure it out with mm -hmm. everything going on at my house. but. I'll figure it out. I'll let you guys know when I'm back on. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, great. Great. Thank you. Uh, well, yeah, we only uh, covered 10 verses, but we really could have gone on for, I'm sure, if we want to go back to it a second time, we could probably uh, even go for at least another hour or two. Um, those verses were so profound, some of the most profound verses in the whole whole Bible. So I enjoyed it very much, but we only skimmed the surface, really. Uh, of what there is in those 10 verses. Um, I also want to talk about uh, the, the chat room. Uh, Renee, amen. Not only did you say the truth and what uh, what needed to be said, but gosh, you say it in such a sweet way, Renee. You're just so, I, I'm, I wish I could be that sweet when I'm, when I'm admonishing. But uh, I'll try. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to say something now. I'll try to be as sweet as Renee. But <laughs> I've never been called sweet. That is so nice. <laughs> wow. Um, okay, so let me give you my thoughts because I have been paying attention and I, I have, um, I'm aware of uh, the comments and the uh, timeouts and the, uh, the uh, removing of, of comments and stuff, all that. Uh, so I, I know what... Uh, I have paid attention. And uh, let me repeat, Renee, what Renee said is that, first of all, um, it, whether you're a moderator or not a moderator, uh, I, I really not only encourage, but I really need to insist. If you're going to be here, if you're going to be participating, if you're brand new, you don't know about it, then, then I, I really want you to do this also. But especially if you're a regular participant in the chat room, you're in the congregation of CES, you really need to understand the rules of uh, the chat room. Uh, and we, we, we put them on the screen. They're, they're on the screen for probably 30 seconds at the beginning of every program. So you can pause it if you need more time to read them. And there's about 12 points. And these every one of these rules were uh, arranged. Uh, devised or let's say uh, they were agreed upon uh, with several hours of meetings and discussions by myself and all, all the moderators or many of the moderators i should say 
to work out some kind of rules that uh, uh, that will allow the chat room to function the way that we want it to. Just, just as if we were all under the same roof. Imagine we're all in the same city, we're under one roof, and we're conducting a Wednesday night Bible study in the church. How would we want everybody to conduct themselves? Well, we had that thought in mind uh, as we wrote those rules. So if you haven't read the rules, you need to read them. Now, let me reflect. First of all, I want to say uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, really, what, um, what you did in the chat room tonight is exactly what we're, we're uh, looking for, Mike. So well done. And um, Victoria, uh, good, good job. Uh, Kevin, uh, some of you, is because you're not aware of the rules, you're, you're interpreting Kevin's actions as being unreasonable. But Kevin is doing exactly what we're asking him to do. And we're asking not only Kevin, but all the moderators to do what Kevin's doing. And that is try to tell people, hey, if you're trying to, if you're changing the subject, like we're, we're not talking about Bible translations. We're talking about these particular three verses right now. Stay focused with us. So we're studying this together. Let's focus on those three verses. Don't change the subject to, to, to uh, get us into talking about the controversial subject of Bible translations, for example. That, that's one thing. But So uh, when Kevin is trying to get people to stay on topic, it's not because he's trying to be really a, a make like your life difficult. He's doing what we are asking him to do and what we need so that the chat room is functioning and we're all on the same page and studying together. So, uh, and the last thing is, of course, um, we don't want... Uh, people to be arguing back and forth about these things. Uh, you know, oh, you're unreasonable, you're unfair, or or whatever it is. This, this, it's embarrassing for the people um, looking at the church and seeing that uh, we're all arguing among each other in that way. So that's why one of the rules, if you read the rules, I think it's one of the last points on the, on the rules, is that if you do think that uh, a moderator has... Uh, uh, conducted themselves in a way, made a decision that was, you know, unfair or unjust or something, then you don't, you don't argue with them publicly. You just say, I'd like to speak to, to uh, everybody after the program and, and get a clarification of why that was done. I, I'm not sure that's, uh, he handled it in the, or she handled it in the right way. You're supposed to do it after the program, not argue among yourself there. So, Kevin, I think you did an excellent job, and I hope that everybody will understand what Kevin is trying to do and, and, and uh, don't react in a way that you're taking it personal or you're thinking he's being unreasonable. He's just, he's just trying to get you to follow the rules that we've established for the chat room, okay? All right, so let's see. Maybe we can do better next time, but uh, we're going to always have – this will be a recurring problem because sometimes we have new people – and if it is someone new, then the moderators also need to be a little bit patient with them too. And I, and I don't think that was violated tonight. I think that it was, uh, there was nothing uh, rude or anything that needed to be uh, 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 corrected. Okay, uh, so this is uh, Wednesday. Uh, now, Friday nights, of course, that's the time where you can uh, – uh, join the chat room and hey, whatever we're talking about on the panel, if, if you want to talk about something else in the chat room, we're not going to enforce that rule on Friday because it's fellowship. It's not for study as much as it is for fellowship. So uh, so if this is something where you want to just chit chat and talk about the weather or your life or whatever is going on, Friday night is the night to do that. But Sunday and Wednesday, these are serious programs and we ask you to stay on topic with us. Okay, so uh, Renee, how did I do? Was I, I tried to be as sweet as you, but you were a saint. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Ben will tell me the truth later, though. <laughs> okay, thank you everybody for participating. Uh, we'll see you on Friday night, 9 30 Eastern time on the same channel. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.